that the dynamics are in terms of profitability that a few companies stand out. And here we have, for instance, HarperCollins, where recently uh, uh, the, 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 the profitability has significantly increased. And so I'm very happy to welcome Brian Murray as the CEO who made that happen. And he uh, will be prepared to uh, talk to us about his strategies, his insights, uh, his vision for this new company. Brian, please. We uh, completed the acquisition of Harlequin, um, a Canadian company with operations all around the world, focusing on uh, you know, women's commercial fiction. Um, and so we completed that acquisition and we've hit the ground running. And uh, their largest uh, international market is in here in Germany. And uh, we announced today that uh, we're forming a HarperCollins Germany and uh, Harlequin imprints here in, in Germany will continue to do everything that they've done, but we will uh, begin a HarperCollins list of an imprint of about 50 commercial fiction titles uh, next fall. So we have a year to go, um, but we're going to build on the team that's uh, here in Germany and, uh, and then we will follow suit in uh, in other markets, uh, using you know, building off of the Harlequin capabilities and their publishing teams and their sales and distribution. Yes, there were a number of uh, reasons that we were excited about the opportunity to combine with Harlequin. Um, we've uh, often over the years looked at um, what we would call the translation markets, um, looking at Europe and so forth, and and um, we were always faced with a you know do you build or do you buy? And um, you know we never pulled the trigger. We never made any investments uh, beyond the English language at HarperCollins. But with the changes in the digital landscape, um, in the, the digital distributors that we have, even some of the online distributors that we have as they have gone around the world, um, we, now, we have relationships with them and uh, now seemed like a good time to seriously look at how do we expand beyond the English language. And when we started asking ourselves, well, who would, what is out there? Uh, what could we potentially uh, look to acquire? Harlequin was a very good fit for HarperCollins because they, over the last 30 years or more, have uh, opened offices in many markets and focused particularly on women's fiction. And they have a brand uh, that's very well known around the world. They're very focused on, uh, on women readers. And we think the combination is going to really help us uh, hit the ground running in Europe. We have uh, big ambitions. I think the combination of skills and capabilities that uh, the, the new kind of Harlequin and HarperCollins teams can bring to, to bear, I think, are going to be very powerful. Um, it won't happen overnight, um, but uh, we've already started sharing some best practices in the English language markets. And uh, for example, Harlequin has a uh, you know, very laser-like focus on, the, on the, the women readers. They have book clubs um, and they have tremendous distribution into um, you know, the Walmarts and, and drugstores. And HarperCollins has uh, different expertise coming at the business more from the trade end, um, a different sort of, uh, you know, kind of an author focus, um, more trade marketing and publicity. And, uh, and, and, and we've done a lot on the digital innovation front. So I think the combination of the two skills and approaches are extremely complementary. And I think, uh, you know, our mantra internally is how do we make uh, one plus one equal three? And, uh, and we're going to follow uh, that kind of guiding principle as we look at all the markets around the world and how do we take the best of what Harlequin has done and the best of what HarperCollins brings and, and make something even stronger. Exactly. I mean, here in Germany, with uh, you know more than 30 years of being in the market, um, our learning curve will be much shorter than it would have been if we tried to launch ourselves um, in Germany. So um, I'm much more confident. Uh, the other announcement was the, the the announcement that we'll be publishing Daniel Silva in in uh, mm -hmm. 16 languages. 
Um, given the capabilities and distribution that Harlequin has, I feel very confident we're going to do a very good job publishing uh, his books. If we were starting from scratch, um, uh, you know, it would be very difficult to uh, to kind of secure that, the rights to that author and to publish in as many markets. But with the combination of HarperCollins and Harlequin, I'm uh, very confident we're going to be able to do that, and that's what we're focused on between now and next fall. Um, no, we'll be adding uh, editorial and marketing in many of the markets where Harlequin is. Um, we, uh, you know, we're just, as I said, we're just getting started and I'm on a bit of a road trip around to visit the teams and all the markets and to see the bookstores and, and understand how they have been successful in their markets. So uh, I am sure we will be uh, adding to staff um, in the editorial marketing areas um, over the coming months. The Harlequin uh, uh, books, the, the romance books in particular, have had very, very strong branding and very, very strong distribution into kiosks um, and into uh, grocery and, and other channels. Um, in some markets, they've moved into um, you know traditional publishing and are in the bookshops. So um, you know, market by market, we're going to uh, look at those strengths and and to add where we need to to make sure that we have complete coverage. And they also have, as I mentioned, book clubs. In many of the markets, they, uh, they still have very strong book club business, which can be very helpful to the HarperCollins list as well. It's a joint decision. So we will have um, editorial um, in, uh, in New York or in Toronto, as well as in all the, the various markets, uh, be part of that decision making. Uh, so we won't be, our plan is not to, to force um, authors uh, into what our plans are. We will talk with each author individually and we will talk to the editors in each market to make sure that we can have a very good publishing plan in those markets. So um, that's why our initial list is, is very small at, at 50 titles, you know, three to four books a month that we can focus on and make sure we do the best possible job publishing in those markets. So um, it will be a combination of, uh, of, of, of input that goes into the ultimate decision. For those who don't know, um, uh, about a, just over a year ago, News Corporation w included uh, many, many businesses, film and television, as well as books and newspapers. And they made the decision um, just about, uh, I guess, 15 months ago to split into two pieces. So we are still part of News Corporation, but it is a, uh, it's a slightly different business. And in those new assets, it's book publishing, it's newspaper publishing, um, there's uh, a couple of uh, uh, marketing services businesses. So um, what's very good for HarperCollins is that um, there's, there's a recognition that the book business is doing quite well. Um, when you compare the book business to other segments in media that have uh, different challenges, whether it's newspapers or music, um, the book publishing industry, I think, has done a very good job, and I think analysts are just starting to realize that now, that, they've, that, that collectively we have transitioned well from a primarily print business to what is now both print and digital. Um, we're now getting the exposure as a result of this split. There are analysts covering uh, HarperCollins. They're asking lots of questions. I found it exciting to uh, get to talk to a lot of investors that uh, there was no interest before, and HarperCollins was a, a rounding error in the, in the larger, the old news corporation. So um, I think it's a great place to be right now, and I think the, the fundamentals of the business, uh, I think they're undervalued, and, um, and I've had a chance to, to talk to analysts and investors and try to tell the story, because it's largely unknown in the investment community what's happening. Often I think they just lump book publishers into other media segments and think, oh, all, digital is all bad. And uh, it's not all bad. <laughs> it's actually quite good. Um, and, so, uh, and so the split has been a very good thing for HarperCollins. And um, you can see the, the fact that we were able to um, invest and, and buy Harlequin and expand our, our uh, international reach is a testament to the fact that they're very confident in the book business and where it can go. Well, look, I mean, a lot of book publishers, uh, you know, it comes down to the books at the end of the day. When you have good books, uh, you know, it, it does flow through to the bottom line. So we happen to have a, 
you know, the kind of property at HarperCollins over the last year, uh, the Veronica Ross Divergent series that um, was spectacular. Um, it's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, I wish could happen more frequently. So that's one, that's one major driver, but there are a lot of other things besides that one property. Many of our markets around the world have, uh, have had improved profitability. Um, we have uh, been looking to uh, kind of streamline our, our physical infrastructure and get as efficient as possible. And then on the digital side, we've been investing in uh, new marketing techniques and new business models and um, new ways to reach readers. So we're constantly trying to get the right balance between uh, resources that are tied to the, the slowly declining print business and making sure we reinvest to get the growth on the digital side. And, uh, and I think that has also played a, a role in our increasing uh, profitability. I do. I think there's a, th there is going to be an equilibrium. Um, and what's been, what has been uh, fascinating to watch is how the, the digital versus print uh, varies by genre. I mean, I, I certainly didn't predict that uh, three, four, five years ago, but we see fiction being very digital, nonfiction, not very digital. And uh, so, um, you know, we're learning things about the, the readers and obviously each market varies significantly too, depending on uh, the, you know, the channels and how the channels compete with one another. You see different uh, growth rates in different markets. So I am absolutely certain that, you know, print is here, you know, for a long, long time. And, uh, and we're striving to create, um, you know, really balance between print and digital. And, uh, and I think we've made some good progress along those lines. Um, and uh, we've seen in the U.S., for example, that the independent channel is, is doing quite well. Um, so despite uh, some uh, large chain going out of business, we've seen this um, kind of uh, reinvigoration in the independent channel, and we're very supportive of that channel. I've done a number of initiatives to, to help support independent bookstores, um, and we're going to continue to do that because we want to make sure all of these sales channels can uh, coexist with one another and hopefully complement you know, HarperCollins and our authors. We definitely, uh, we lean forward and we want to try new things. We want to, we always learn whether something succeeds or fails, we learn in the process. Um, we want to be the, you know, the first to learn. And when something works, we, we double down and uh, we do more of it. And, uh, you know, we, we have been very happy with the results. You mentioned that some of the subscription services. So we've expanded those. We've expanded the number of titles that are in them. We've also expanded geographically. Um, and we're learning a lot about, uh, about the readers um, as a result. So um, we are, you know, we, we feel like the world is getting more and more complex, both in print and in digital. And as publishers representing all of our authors, we want to uh, we want to understand that complexity and figure out how we can use it to their advantage. And um, it, you know, we're constantly looking at uh, ways to try different business models. We're constantly looking at ways to create new uh, formats, whether it's bundling or um, you know, we were early on trying to figure out how to have video into our books where it made sense. Um, so we're we're not standing still, and and I don't think in this day and age where, you know, these companies come up seemingly overnight with, uh, you know, billion dollar valuations and next thing you know, they're trying to get into the publishing business. Uh, you have to be at the forefront and you have to try things. And, uh, and we're going to continue to do that. Well, the, um, uh, you know, I mentioned the subscription programs. They have been uh, surprising to us. It, uh, we've seen that, the, that is, it is serving the long tail extremely well. Um, as the business has shifted from a print world uh, to increasingly digital, one of the challenges for publishers is discovery. We've all talked about that for a long time. And what we've seen in the digital world, every time you have a new partner, a new digital partner, um, and a new digital offer, you're creating new merchandising opportunities. Um, so while the tables at the front of bookstore chains, maybe there are fewer of those tables for marketing and promotion, when you introduce a brand new um, uh, e-tailer or a different 
ebook model or just distribution partner, you are picking up new ways to market your books. And um, subscription has turned out to be a model that is very successful in, in really merchandising and mining the backlist and the catalog. And, uh, and that's been a surprise to us at how much turn there is in that uh, deep catalog. And, uh, and so that's, as a result, we've, we've expanded that model. Um, so, uh, and there's things that we tried, you know, we, that haven't worked, but sometimes we're just too early. And so we don't give up. We, uh, you know, if we believe in something long-term, we're gonna keep at it. Everything from the uh, Espresso book machine, where our books are available, if independent booksellers would, would like to put a machine in their shop, and while someone's getting a coffee, they can print out a backlist book. You know, hasn't taken off yet, but we believe that's, that's an important capability to, um, uh, you know, to uh, uh, expedited shipping that we're doing for independent booksellers um, during the holiday period. It's something that we're doing in the U.S. because we think it really helps. So, um, and bundling is another innovation that uh, hasn't quite happened yet. Um, I think I've heard from many readers and we've done consumer research that suggests there is demand for it. I just don't feel like any of our partners have done um, the ideal, the optimal merchandising of bundles. And I think that will happen. I think uh, there is demand and eventually we'll get there. So um, we're trying things in, in terms of bundling on our own website. We're trying them with partners. Uh, and I think someday um, that will happen. It clearly happened in other media. It happened in the home entertainment business where you can buy a DVD and you get downloading and you also get streaming as well as high definition. You know, you get everything all in one. Uh, I think that there's, uh, there's opportunity there for um, book, book readers who want to have the print book but also might like to know that they have the ebook there on their phone or their tablet that's accessible at any point in time. And uh, as long as we're able to uh, increase awareness and, and you know, increase uh, royalties for authors, that's something that we'll pursue. Our first priority is through our, our traditional, uh, you know, our kind of our trusted bookselling partners. That's always going to be our, our bread and butter. That's where um, authors are primarily discovered. And uh, so that's our first priority. But we have, we publish in certain genres um, and we have certain authors that have been asking for help in, uh, in selling direct. Some authors' books may not be available in, widely available in bookshops. Um, so we've, in our e-commerce initiative that you're talking about, we now have the ability to sell e-books in multiple currencies all around the world. And that shopping cart can be uh, embedded into an author's website or it can be, uh, you know, or the, or the it, it can, the, obviously through our own websites around the world, it can be used. Um, in the U.S., we're able to sell both print and e-books. Um, eventually, that we'll have the same capabilities in, in the other international markets. So I see that as uh, a kind of a, again, developing a new capability. It's, it's another innovation where we need to keep inventing and offering authors greater and greater service and greater and greater value. And um, the uh, incremental royalty you're talking about is a reflection of here's an extra service. It's totally up to authors if they choose to use it or not. Um, but if they do choose to use it, there's an economic incentive for them to partner with us. We, we represent all of our authors and, and their business interests, and um, we tend not to do business deals that would devalue the, the, uh, you know, the royalty income and the rights, uh, the value of their work. Um, so we're open to deals where we think there's incremental value or additional value that can be captured for our authors, but um, most of the time you get proposals where it's the opposite and those are, we say no far more often than we say yes. Anytime you combine two companies, um, what you just described are the two uh, complementary capabilities that they have. If you combine two companies with exactly the same capabilities, you have one plus one equals one. 
And so what's very um, exciting and, and why we're so interested in, Har in Harlequin is that we have complementary skills. And so when we look at how do we, um, how do we grow, there are immediate uh, ways that we can grow together. So book clubs is one, one area I mentioned. There are, we have so much content on the HarperCollins side that has not been fully exploited through book clubs, for example. Um, and so we immediately are able to start exploring ways that we can grow uh, the readership of what were, you know, Avon. We have an Avon imprint that was a romance imprint in the U.S. and in the U.K. We're now able to offer those authors um, avenues of distribution and marketing that we could not do before. So that's one example of how Harlequin's strength in the, uh, in the book club business um, benefits uh, HarperCollins authors. And going the other way, I mentioned many of the digital innovations. We have been um, among the most aggressive in, for example, going into uh, some of these subscription services, one being Scribd. We've already announced, because of the, the, the comfort and the success that we've had with Scribd, we've already announced that the Harlequin catalog is, has gone into the script. So there's two examples where we have Harlequin authors benefiting from previous relationships, bi innovative business deals that HarperCollins has done, and where HarperCollins authors will benefit from some of the unique skills that Harlequin has. As the leaders of these businesses, it's our job to figure out how to make sure that when we move into these markets that we are taking one plus one and equaling three, and that we wind up with the shared best practices of both. Um, and, and that's actually, that's the fun part of, of working together and figuring out how two big companies um, that do a lot of the same but have these speci specialities can take advantage of, uh, of the people and the expertise that exists in both companies. So far, we've announced that uh, here in Germany, we will the, the corporate brand will be HarperCollins Germany. And the, uh, the, the Harlequin brands, the imprints here that are well known are Cora and Mira. So going forward in Germany, um, we will have the corporate brand be HarperCollins. Cora and Mira will continue to do exactly what they do today. Um, very little change. The, the list, the publishing programs will be unchanged. And then we will launch another list, a HarperCollins imprint um, that will sit alongside Cora and Mira. It will contain our ambitions are to have about 50 titles per year and that will be branded HarperCollins. I would Thanks. expect Only that translations? Translations? Translations. I would expect those, the books in that list to be primarily um, books where we have world rights, probably, uh, you know, uh, American, Canadian, British, Australian writers, uh, where we already have world rights and, um, and we aim and we have a big commitment to those authors to expand their readership. I would anticipate that list will be focused there. Yeah, so Harlequin has uh, three joint ventures, one in Brazil, one in France, and one in Italy. And um, we will talk to those partners, and, and that's part of what I'm doing while I'm here, is to talk to the partners and for us to um, share our, 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 our goals and our ambitions. Uh, so I don't really have answers uh, for the JVs, but where we own 100% of the business, um, we uh, intend to kind of do the same thing that we're doing in Germany. So on Monday, I was in Stockholm meeting with the, the Nordic group up there, and, and uh, I'm going to Hamburg, uh, on, uh, Amsterdam and Hamburg over the next few days to begin these conversations. Um, but we wanted to start with Germany because it's the largest uh, uh, international division of Harlequin, and it's the largest market in Europe. So that was our initial focus. Too soon to tell. And for the next, uh, you know, year, I would say we are very focused on just getting our own list going. You know, we do have a lot to learn. There, there still is a learning curve, uh, at least for the HarperCollins side, and for me and and my immediate management team. Uh, so uh, we will see how we'll see how our list goes, and anything's possible in the future. But 
Um, you know, the, the Harlequin acquisition gave us this immediate scale um, where we are as broad as the largest trade publisher in the world, but with probably uh, less than half the revenues. So we now have a, a very large global footprint and uh, we, can be, we can be aggressive now in buying rights to, uh, you know, world rights to some commercial fiction authors. And, uh, and we have these capabilities that we didn't have before. So I feel like it uh, really gives us um, an avenue to grow our business and to, to uh, particularly grow our revenues and our market share around the world. We're always going to sell rights. Um, you know, we have world rights today on maybe 60% of the titles that we acquire, and it's been that way for uh, probably 10 years. So um, our acquisition strategy won't change. The only thing, and, we, and there's hundreds of, I mean, a thou probably a thousand books a year where we're selling rights, and we're talking about a list of 50 titles. So, um, and it will be very focused around commercial fiction. So I don't see a major change in um, our overall, how we go to market and how we sell rights. Uh, and, and we're not talking about uh, you know, any 50 titles. It's very focused around the commercial titles um, because that's that is- That's the start, it's that, the start. That's the start, right. And that's the strength of uh, Harlequin has been uh, the commercial titles and distribution into sales channels where commercial titles can do quite well. Yeah, I, I wish I could answer that question, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I really can't. I can't say anything about uh, you know any one company. Um, so while I would like to, I'm going to have to decline. Yeah, I'm, Brazil's uh, very important. You can see how you know Brazil fits into our larger uh, strategy at HarperCollins. Um, we have, uh, through Harlequin, we have a joint venture with Record, and uh, we just increased uh, our stake where we have uh, control of uh, our joint venture, our Thomas Nelson, which is our, our Christian publishing division in Brazil. So um, in all of the markets where, uh, you know, where we see long-term growth for book publishing, we want to be there. We want to, um, we want to uh, invest in those markets. And uh, Brazil is right up there at the top when we look at uh, markets and you look at the overall trends and the economy and, and consumers and literacy. Um, I, I think uh, over the, the, you know, the medium to long term, Brazil is going to be a very important publishing market. Um, so we're, uh, you know, we're new to the market there. Um, as, as you know, I've been there, uh, I've been there just once, but uh, I was very impressed with the market. Uh, and, uh, and we're now beginning to take steps um, in Brazil, just like we're now taking steps all around the world to uh, expand the HarperCollins brand. Yeah, I mean, the, the Spanish language market is uh, more like the, the English language market, where there are many, many markets. So um, I'm, uh, I'm going go to go to uh, Madrid uh, very soon to meet the team there. Um, I, uh, you know, I don't want to, I, I don't know enough to really comment, but uh, obviously, uh, you know, Spanish uh, being one of the most widely read languages is a very important language, and we do sell a, a lot of rights, and we do have some very small Spanish language publishing today, and uh, certainly in our, our Christian division. Uh, so, uh, so we have a lot to learn there, and we'll be looking at, uh, at that market over the coming months. Yeah, so our, um, you know, we, we've, we've seen, um, you know, the, the, the fiction market and the, uh, and the Christian market as areas where we wanted to have, uh, you know, very strong market share. Um, both genres, the, the content tends to travel internationally. We all know nonfiction doesn't travel as well, and, and children's uh, publishing can also be very uh, specific to each culture. So we have uh, purposely gone out and tried to uh, achieve, uh, you know, strong market share in, in Christian and in and in fiction. Uh, so we think, uh, for example, on the fiction side, the the book clubs and the director consumer opportunities might give us some marketing advantages. And similarly, on the Christian side, uh, South America in particular, North America and South America, are uh, we, we see that there's a tremendous interest in growth in Christian content, and we're well positioned to 
develop the sales, marketing, and distribution channels into those areas. Um, so, so we have a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a, a vertical, uh, ambitious strategy in those particular areas, and and we've looked for publishing content that's going to help us uh, realize those, uh, you know, those ambitions. So. Um, that's how we see it, and then of course there's the rest of our uh, publishing. We're still very strong and very aggressive in nonfiction um, and children's, but they tend to be much more closely tied to the individual cultures, and it's more difficult to have books uh, travel from one market to another. Uh, d you know, I don't know yet. Um, we have a little bit to learn. Uh, we do we do publish there's a little bit of overlap um, there's a couple of interesting genres uh, Amish fiction being one but uh, I don't know how that's going to sort out in the end it does work um, we work very closely with uh, the newspapers in the, in the UK we work very closely with the newspapers in the US um, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Post um, there are, uh, you know, there are synergies on the marketing front. Um, there are also a number of, uh, you know, digital initiatives that we're beginning to try. The overlap of readers of magazines and um, newspapers and books, obviously, is very, very high. So I think there's untapped potential there on the marketing front. Um, with uh, Hollywood, we have, th there are many, many uh, joint deals, but they're more on the project basis. So um, just yesterday, we launched uh, Endgame by James Fry. It's a, a teen, it's the first book in a teen trilogy. Fox will be doing the movie. Um, I'm not, it hasn't been scheduled yet, but it may be a year to come. So hopefully by book two comes out, the film. And that was a deal that we, we, uh, we definitely were helping each other out. Um, and there are other examples. Um, we acquired uh, Patricia Cornwall. Um, she'll be will pu be publishing her book in November, and Fox is also developing a movie based on her character. So, uh, so there are it's more on a project by project basis. It's very hard, though, I think, to kind of force top-down synergy between book publishing and uh, and movies and television. I think that's the fantasy that you were referring. It's much more of a collaborative, creative experience where you have to have, within the organizations of the different media outfits, they have to have an understanding of, uh, of their taste and what's working, and then it can flourish. So um, while... While News Corporation did split into two pieces, there's a, still a significant shared ownership between the two. So we still work with them, um, but they're, they are separate legal entities. So it still happens, and it's increasingly happening as we go forward. Um, we've seen, particularly with some of these most successful books, um, for us, Divergent, and, and for some of the others with, uh, you know, with Hachette, with Stephanie Myers, the, and the Twilight series with Scholastic, the, uh, the film companies in particular are working very closely with book publishers because they've realized it's in their interest to have the largest book readership before the film comes out. And so the marketing campaigns are now aligned between the film companies and the book companies in the US. And uh, so there's a lot of development happening behind the scenes to make sure that the awareness of the series, which is a, starts as a book series, is at its highest peak before the film is released. I mean, it all starts with a story. It starts with an author and an idea. And, um, and the book is and always will be a fantastic format for storytelling. And, um, and so, you know, we see, uh, you know, particularly, you know, film and television producers, whether it's George R.R. R. Martin um, with Game of Thrones um, or it's, uh, you know, the Divergent series, we see them turning more frequently to original content that comes from books today. Um, Hollywood went through a phase, you know, five to 15 years ago where it was all of the comic book characters. I mean, they've all been done. <laughs> so they're, they've returned to book publishers to find the great storytellers. And we're in a perfect situation to, uh, to help introduce them to who we think are the great voices and storytellers uh, of the future. I just read The Miniaturist, which was uh, published uh, in the UK um, and was a, a, a debut author in the UK. 
did very well. Um, I think it was number one for a few weeks, and we were publishing it in the in the U.S. So, I'm always interested in the differences in culture. So I thought, wow, how did uh, why was this number one in the U.K. and you know we were publishing two months later in the U.S. So I was very curious to uh, uh, have a read and and see see what I thought. So um, so anyway, that's the last book I read. So I have half of it, but not all of it. So I hope that counts.